Thanks so much for joining us on this 28th day of April 2017 or 2019 for uh, Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy. I'll be hosting tonight's show. Uh, up first here on Hazardous Weather Graphic, uh, high wind warning has snuck into the St. Lawrence Island area as well as the Bering Strait Coast. That goes into effect actually at 6 p.m. Sunday evening and stays out through tonight and into uh, at least midday tomorrow. And winds uh, currently gusting to 40 miles an hour here at uh, 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon at Gamble. Expected to uh, continue to increase and uh, should see 35 miles an hour sustained with gusts above 60 miles an hour again through this area uh, tonight into uh, midday tomorrow. And on the breakup map here, we're getting an increasing area along the Tanah River here of uh, open, an open stretch here that's uh, noticeably growing by the day, at least from one chart to the next here. But, uh, and of course, the uh, Little Susitna River, as well as the uh, Main Susitna River, mostly open now, or just about all open. Uh, Kuskokwim Valley, a lot of areas that have some open ice on them, all the way down to the mouth there, which has been the case for quite some time. Yukon, a little slower here. Uh, this area of some open appears to be expanding a little bit here east of uh, Eagle, but still a lot of white all the way down into the delta. And from there, taking a look at fire danger, some expanded areas. Again, this is a uh, high fire danger for the uh, fuel type known as grass here in these areas. See Bristol Bay into the north, almost into the southern Cuscoquim Valley, quite an expanse of high fire danger. Same thing over the, over the uh, Cuscoquim Delta. Uh, today with uh, sunshine or at least uh, temperatures in the 50s and some breezy conditions and also along the north side of the Alaska Range, the so Sitna Valley, western Kenai Peninsula and uh, in the Copper River Basin. And from there we'll move on to satellite imagery and you can see a pretty good batch of clouds here near or over Kodiak Island and off to the east there where it becomes mostly cirrus by the time it reaches the southeast coast. But that's due to uh, strengthening upper level low that's uh, right about in this area here. And you have the dry air coming down from the northeast on the west and northwest side of that feature. And then this, the southwest flow, usually uh, associated with rising motion that creates the clouds and precipitation. Kind of a rainy day at Kodiak today with about two tenths of an inch falling uh, by this afternoon there. Also, uh, some rain getting up uh, in toward uh, Kamishak Bay today but not quite reaching the Kenai Peninsula area yet. And again, those clouds of the higher variety spreading eastward. Otherwise, mostly sunny skies to just plain sunshine here across southern Alaska, well into the interior. And uh, back to the west, we have the southerly flow uh, systems coming in. Uh, another front here, one yesterday brought gills weakened considerably, shifting up to the northeast here. And then this one bringing uh, rain into Adek and Atka today, periods of light rain with uh, winds gusting 40 to 50 miles per hour there. And then the uh, remnant moisture of these systems spreading northeastward there. But just, that's just clouds. Rain was even off to the west at St. Lawrence Island, but that's uh, kicking the gradient up, becoming quite windy, even along the southwest coast, but uh, from Nikolsky to the Pribilofs, 30, 40 mile an hour wind gusts today at Cape Newenham, normally windier area, had gusts of 45 miles per hour, and I mentioned the 40 miles an hour currently there at uh, Gamble, and uh, gusts 55 miles an hour at Cape Lisbourne, and about 45 or so for Point Hope, uh, up in that area, kind of a classic wind pattern uh, has is taken shape here with high pressure over the interior and then lower pressure back to the west with these systems uh, moving off to the northeast. On the chart, uh, you can see uh, kind of a tightening gradient here. Uh, definitely a lot more of a gradient out over the Chukchi and Bering Sea than there is over the interior. 
And this front here mostly shifting off up into the Russian Far East with the moisture staying west of St. Lawrence Island, trailing back into this next system here coming, crossing the western Aleutians currently with the rain and winds there, but uh, sunshine here across Bristol Bay on the north and northwest side of the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern Aleutians but moisture coming northwestward here, banking up along the Alaska Peninsula there. And the light rain was kind of a common feature here on down the Alaska Peninsula, but it was all on the southern side. And uh, mounts became much less than the two-tenths of an inch Kodiak got to just uh, sprinkles by the time we reached the eastern Aleutians are cutting off altogether. We can see quite a bit of uh, sunshine here from the southwest interior all the way up into the upper Tanah Valley, 40-mile country, north to the Brooks Range, possibly even over the eastern north slope, southeast coast today, pretty nice. Uh, some clouds along the coast, but sunshine as you moved inland. And for tonight, that pattern will generally continue. Probably see an increase in the lower clouds, maybe some fog right along the coastline there, staying fair in the interior. Winds light, dry conditions, periods of rain continue for Kodiak Island as this uh, kind of a trough here has trouble getting its act together but that's going to keep it damp and unsettled for Kodiak into uh, Kamishak Bay. And that's starting to push a little farther to the north. Some precipitation could reach Middleton Island, but will stay south of Prince William Sound through tonight, maybe just clipping. Port Moeller could get some light rain and uh, possibly Seldovia. Otherwise, just look for maybe a little bit of an increase in the clouds across Cook Inlet, dry over the interior, windy conditions. Here again, probably continue to see those 50 to 60 mile an hour wind gusts there for Cape Lisbon Point Hope. And again, high wind warnings out St. Lawrence Island through tonight and the Bering Strait coastal areas, but dry here over the eastern Bering. Could be some areas of fog and low clouds with some IFR conditions right through this area, which would include the prayer bluffs. Uh, no change tonight for the eastern Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula, this front weakening and the precipitation shield narrowing there as it tries to uh, push eastward. And we'll see for tomorrow, Monday, we've got that front continuing to weaken. Uh, not quite so fast there, holding together enough to keep some periods of rain that will push into the eastern Aleutians. Looks wet and breezy for the Perbolofs tomorrow and the strongest winds up here around St. Lawrence Island that will be uh, slowly diminishing into the afternoon. Look for some uh, moisture to get into the area there during the day tomorrow, but uh, still a fair chance of some sunshine here over the inland areas of the Yukon Cusquam Delta, Norton Sound on up into Kotzebue Sound, and definitely mostly clear skies with high pressure over the central eastern interior, winds light and uh, dry for the eastern Arctic coast, maybe some clearing. This area here as it comes up and over the ridge tracking eastward is just barely grazing the western to central Arctic coast. Uh, just a slight chance of that moisture, of course, any oscillation one way or the other would either put you in or completely out of it. Showers behind that front over the Aleutians with gusty west-southwest winds, sunshine for the southeast coast, and uh, look for maybe a little bit more of an increase in the clouds on the outer coastline there. Low clouds and fog could push possibly into portions of the inside waters, but staying dry, wind staying light, same thing for the north Gulf Coast here. Moisture coming up, uh, chance of showers, Kenai Peninsula, Prince William Sound, and that trough kind of pulls back to the northwest here, lying right about in this position. Tuesday afternoon, periods of light rain again, Kodiak, and now up over the southwest interior. Of course, that will lower those fire dangers uh, for the areas that were elevated here, especially today. And stays dry, though, mostly sunny, Copper River Basin. No change in the interior. In fact, uh, highs could rise into the mid-60s in the Tanah Valley area. And staying dry over the southeast coast, as I mentioned, and Dry conditions, fair skies all the way up to the Arctic coast. And for the lows tonight out in the Aleutians, uh, generally in the upper 30s. Otherwise, teens from the Brooks Range out to the eastern Arctic coast, considerably milder. In fact, above freezing for the lows there from Point Lay all the way down into Kotzebue and uh, the uh, Seward Peninsula. Lower to mid 30s here, become upper 30s over Bristol Bay, lower 40s Alaska Peninsula and possibly as low as uh, 18, 20 over the Copper River Basin, otherwise 25 to 35 southern Alaska, and uh, in the 30s for the Panhandle Heights tomorrow. Upper 50s to lower 60s here for the interior areas, eastern interior, and uh, lower 30s in the Arctic coast, 55 to 63 for the southeast coast, mid 40s over the uh, Kodiak Island area, and then your lows, much like uh, you'll see tomorrow morning here on Tuesday morning, followed by highs, Again, into the mid-60s in the Fairbanks area. And now, 
aviation weather around Alaska. First line weather graphic for Monday morning. A batch of IFR here over the East Central Bering Sea on up to the Bering Strait and more out farther to the west. This area extending down to the eastern Aleutians and along the south side of the Alaska Peninsula on up the east side of Kodiak, almost reaching the southeast coast. Good VFR here over the southern half of the state and maybe some marginal stuff up here in the uh, northern valleys and the central Arctic coast. And for the afternoon, that uh, retreats back to the north of the Brooks Range there, whatever south of the mountains to start the day with. Otherwise, we still have IFR, Eastern Bering Sea, and north of the uh, central and western Aleutians. And then a zone here across the Fox Islands, about the same as it was in the morning, into the Gulf of Alaska, and marginal VFR fast along the coast, otherwise a panhandle, uh, generally VFR, as well as the interior. And then the following morning, a little bit more in the way of some uh, IFR stuff up here in the uh, north and northwest, up to the south slopes of the Brooks Range. And also on the north slope, a uh, narrower area of VFR here in the uh, interior. Marginal VFR spreading over Cook Inlet, Kenai Peninsula, and uh, IFR slipping on up into Prince William Sound, especially the west side there, Passage Canal and the Barren Islands with uh, Kodiak on the east side, IFR and IFR holding here over the eastern Bering Sea, some VFR breaking out over the western and central Aleutian areas, and uh, pushing inland a little bit, the marginal VFR there along the southeast coast, but in the afternoon that uh, pulls back a little more back out to the coastline or maybe a little off the coast. Otherwise, another VFR day there for the southeast and Copper River Basin as well. Interior looking good. Marginal VFR, western Susitna Valley and along the eastern slopes of the entire western Alaska range down to the Aleutian Range. And a not so big area of IFR here from St. Lawrence Island down to the Alaska Peninsula. Passes for tomorrow, another VFR day for both Anatovic and Adigan. And for Lake Clark and Merrill, VFR once again all the way around the Alaska Range. Ceilings visibility is unlimited, windy. Isabel Mintesta. And uh, coming southward, Tanita VFR for Portage, VFR to start, and then moisture sliding on up into western Prince William Sound, probably uh, marginal VFR, especially on the eastern entrance, and less of a threat on the west side, but conditions will be coming down across the entire area in the afternoon. And for Chilkoot and White, uh, VFR once again. Freezing levels tomorrow, 2,000 feet here, uh, right over south central Alaska, actually Kenai, uh, Kenai Peninsula and Cook Inlet. And that uh, kind of slips on down the southeast coast there, but much warmer conditions coming in with that strong southerly flow here in the Bering Sea, 10,000 feet, uh, shifting eastward a little bit there into the uh, eastern or east central Bering Sea around Atka Island, but 8,000 feet all the way up uh, there to the uh, Russian coast, 2,000 feet all the way into the Arctic. And for the icing, uh, just a slight chance way out there for Shumi and that too. Otherwise, icing free basically over the Bering Sea. This zone right through here associated with that very weak frontal boundary could be some isolated rime icing with that, but you got to get up above 8,000 feet. And for uh, the uh, Montague Island area, that moisture coming up could be a zone of uh, considerable moderate, possibly there above about 7,000 feet of the rime variety, and then lighter amounts down across Kodiak. Uh, upper air chart here at 33,000 feet, uh, high pressure right on up into the interior, continuing to hold. But this uh, disturbance here spinning up and really uh, still lingering here over actually the uh, southern Kenai Peninsula, but pulling back to the west and actually developing a little bit more there. So 60 knots on the east side of that, another jet back out here southerly uh, uh, pulling the warm air northward there into the Bering Sea. 9,000 feet, we're looking at southerlies, 20 to 30 knots across eastern Bering into the Bering Strait, up to 40 knots along the western Arctic coast. Pretty light though over the central eastern interior, on down the Panhandle. Same pattern at uh, 3,000 feet, westerlies 30 to 45 knots here with that system. And southeast 25 across Kodiak, southerlies 25 knots over the western interior. Turn southwest, possibly as high as 45 knots at 3,000 feet there along the uh, western Arctic coast and 35 knot subtleties through the Bering Strait to St. Lawrence Island, light on the east side and the panhandle, turbulence pretty smooth for the southeast coast, 
With those winds here, we've got a zone of uh, considerable moderate chop from Iliamna Lake right up into the Western Brooks Range and the Southern Kenai Peninsula and the Aleutians as well. After the break, I'll be back with a look at the marine forecasts. On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake off the Pacific coast of Japan generated a tsunami. This series of ocean waves sped towards the island nation with waves reaching 24 feet high. The result was devastation and utter destruction. Towns were engulfed by water and swept away. Farmland was flooded. Tens of thousands of lives were lost. The National Police Agency reported damages to hundreds of roads, bridges, and more than 100,000 buildings. The surging water flooded rivers and destroyed harbors. In some areas along the coast, tsunami waves reached six miles inland. Tsunamis not only cause severe damage when they first strike land, but also as the water recedes back to sea. Tsunamis can inflict this type of damage because of some unique features. As tsunami waves travel across ocean basins, they may be as little as a few centimeters high, but they extend down to the ocean floor. This is different than traditional waves, which are only surface features. Tsunamis can also travel hundreds of miles per hour in the open ocean. As these waves approach a coast, the shallowing ocean floor slows the waves down and pushes the water mass upwards. The quicker the ocean floor transitions from deep to shallow, the greater potential for a higher wave height. So, tsunamis that experience this sudden shift into shallow water can have the height and momentum to pack a serious punch. Unfortunately, Japan found itself in this scenario. This image shows how abruptly the Japanese islands rise out of the ocean. Other coastal areas in the region have much more gradual slopes. The earthquake on March 11th was the most powerful known to hit Japan, and the tsunami it created had the necessary ingredients to make it such a deadly and destructive force. Eighty miles east of Japan, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake rocks the ocean floor. This disturbance causes a transfer of energy from the seafloor to the ocean, generating a series of ocean waves known as a tsunami. In about 20 minutes, waves strike the Japanese coastline. Other nations go on high alert because the tsunami will propagate or spread throughout the Pacific Ocean. As the tsunami radiates outward from Japan, it encounters a variety of ocean features, such as ridges and underwater volcanoes, which guide the tsunami and create a complex pattern of scattering and reflective waves. In eight hours, the waves reach the Hawaiian Islands, and in nine and a half hours, they hit the west coast of the United States. In 16 hours, the tsunami reaches the Indian Ocean and New Zealand, and by 22 hours, the entire Pacific Ocean had been affected. The impact of a tsunami can be highly variable because of the complicated interactions with ocean features and coastline elements. Wave height and speed will differ from place to place. Since tsunamis can be hundreds of miles long and travel thousands of miles away from where they originated, they are considered a worldwide threat when they form. These are the sounds of a tsunami warning. They alert residents that a killer wave is about to strike. These sirens, however, are just a small part of the sophisticated warning systems that played a role in Japan and in the U.S. during the Pacific Ocean tsunami in March 2011. 
Most tsunamis are generated by an undersea earthquake. Fortunately, Japan has one of the most advanced earthquake early warning systems in the world. It detects tremors, calculates the epicenter, and sends out warnings from over a thousand seismographs scattered throughout the country. The Japan Meteorological Agency issues the warnings and sends alerts to television and radio channels, the internet, and mobile phone networks. When the earthquake struck 80 miles offshore, warnings were generated in about three seconds. The tsunami warnings came three minutes later. These take longer because more complex calculations are involved and must factor in ocean data. Since the first tsunami wave struck the coastline within 20 minutes, the advanced warning provided some residents with crucial minutes to reach a safe area. While the earthquake sent powerful tsunami waves westward toward Japan, the tsunami also propagated east into the Pacific Ocean. Here, warnings are issued by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, operated by NOAA in Hawaii. NOAA maintains a large network of buoys with ocean floor sensors that are strategically positioned in the earthquake-prone zones of the Pacific. This system collects vital ocean data for tsunami forecasting. On March 11th, only 25 minutes after the earthquake struck, the first buoy station measured the tsunami and relayed information to Hawaii. Scientists use this data to run models and issue forecasts and warnings to nations throughout the Pacific. From there, local emergency managers decided what actions were appropriate to take for public safety. The earthquake and resulting tsunami devastated the Japanese coastline, causing damage that will take years to repair. While we can't prevent these forces of nature from happening, our early warning systems can help us prepare for the dangers headed our way. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Sea ice analysis uh, today, significantly thinning ice here south of St. Lawrence Island, just what was seen yesterday. And with the uh, good south winds, warmer temperatures here coming up, uh, still expect this uh, ice edge to advance northward, anywhere from 40 to 65 nautical miles over the next five days. So uh, sea ice out here is going to do a vanishing act during the upcoming week. And for the coastal water forecast, southeast coast, uh, northwest, 15 to 20 knots here across much of the area with six-foot seas. Northwest, 15 for Clarence Strait. Otherwise, Stevens Passage, Lynn Canal, Glacier Bay areas, as well as the uh, other inside waters, northwest at 10 or so with uh, two-foot seas. And those light wind conditions last into Tuesday as well. Here, northwest, 10 to 15 knots inside waters. Increasing winds on the uh, coast, uh, north to northwest, 20 to 25 knots. So we got small craft advisories coming in for Tuesday and northwest, 20 to 25 knots uh, up on the north coast. Prince William Sound tomorrow, northeast, 20 knots, seas at four feet. Small craft advisories here, east, 30 knots for the eastern north Gulf Coast. And then we've got northeasterly gales for the eastern north Gulf Coast right on down across the Barren Islands there of 35 knots, 10 to 11 foot seas, northeast 30, Kamishak Bay. And small craft advisories for Cook Inlet, northeast 25, seas 6 to 8 feet. And then for Tuesday, Cook Inlet, north 15 to 20 knots, and seas uh, coming down as well a little bit, 3 to 5 feet. East 25, Kamishak Bay, much lighter winds for the Barren Islands. Southeast 20 there, seven foot seas and variable 15 uh, for the North Gulf Coast with uh, seas running six to seven feet and lighter, more variable winds for Prince William Sound with slight seas. Kodiak Island, uh, easterly winds at about 25 on the east side here, but Shelikoff Strait carrying some gales. Northeast 35, seas 12 feet. East 25 for the Alaska Peninsula. Also for Bristol Bay, east winds 25 knots. Outlook for Tuesday, south to southeast coming down to 20 knots here for the Alaska Peninsula there with uh, seas as high as 10 feet on the Pacific side and southeast 25, small craft advisories continue for Bristol Bay, 20 knots southeast winds up to Sitkanak and up the east side of Kodiak and then easterly at 20 for Shilakoff Strait. Aleutians out west, uh, gales tomorrow, west 35 knots and those turn south from about uh, Amchitka across uh, Adak and Atka, 
All 30 knot winds from the south there tomorrow. Sees as high as 22 feet back here to the west. Small craft advisories for the Fox Islands with southeast winds 20 to 30 knots and sea 6 to 10 feet. Those fall back to uh, kind of a more variable lighter wind pattern for Tuesday there with the speeds at about 15 to 20 knots. Small craft advisory central illusion south to southwest at 25, southwest 30, 14 foot seas for the western areas. Southwest coast, southeast winds tomorrow, 30 knots, seas 9 to 10 feet. And then we've got uh, about the same pattern there for the Pribilof, southeast 30 gales, St. Matthew Island, just edging into the gale category there with uh, five more knots. And then St. Lawrence Island, southeast at 30. So that'll be coming down in the afternoon. They'll be stronger in the morning. And then east 25 for Norton Sound and St. Lawrence Island on Tuesday, southeast 25 to 30 along the coast, way down south, or coming down considerably there for the Pribilof Southwest 15. And up along the eastern Beaufort Sea coastline, up, uh, well, on the east side there, over to demarcation point, the winds will be the lightest southeast at 10. And then they pick up to about 15 on the east side, and then the central coast up to Bruce Wind Advisory Level, south 25. The winds continue to increase as you head west and south. Uh, 30 knots here for the west side, and then Gales, Cape Thompson to Cape Beaufort, south 35 knots, southeast 30 for the southeast Chuck CC. Moving into Tuesday, lighter winds now and more easterly here from Wales all the way up to Cape Thompson. And then the uh, western coast there, about 15 knots or so, much lighter, still south, but down to 10 knots in the central coast and really lightening up, just about losing any wind altogether there for the eastern Beaufort Sea coast. And for tonight, uh, fair skies up that way, maybe even clearing. Uh, clouds back to the west, so and definitely windier, but it should stay dry. This moisture should move northward and stay west of the area, including uh, Tin City, possibly. St. Lawrence Island getting a little close there, but uh, again, high wind warning out for there tonight until midday tomorrow on up to the Bering Strait coast for gusts above 60 miles an hour. And stays fair, but increasing clouds and increasing precipitation here. Kodiak Island kind of shifts up into South Central and uh, wetter though out to the west, stays sunny and mild over the interior, it's mid 60s in the Tanana Valley. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.